Good morning, Connection. Thank you for tuning in. Kyle Sunderland here. We are going to continue our devotional series in Exodus. Today we will be in Exodus 22, verse 16, and we will go all the way through chapter 23. Um, there's a few key points we're going to be hitting on. We're going to be talking about social justices. Um, we're going to be talking about the Sabbath and festivals. And then we will be talking about the conquest that God has promised. Um, if you've listened to my devos before, you know I like to start off with a word of prayer. So if you would, bow your, bow your head with me and let's invite God into this uh, time of devotion, please. Father God, thank you for meeting us where we're at. No matter where in our life or in our journey or the path that we're on, you're going to be there alongside us. Whether it's our first time reaching out to you and talking to you or it's like talking to a family member or a best friend. You are there in all walks of our life. And I thank you for that, Father. With the way the world is and society is right now, everyone's on pins and needles, what's going on um, through election, through pandemic, through it all, Father. Don't let us lose sight that you are still in control, that you have a plan, that you are here for us, that you are the one steering the ship father when we try to take that from you please remind us that it's you that's in control as we dive in today into our devotion father i ask that you meet us where we're at open our eyes our minds and our hearts so that we can receive what it is that you're wanting us to take out of today's reading father i pray these things in jesus name amen okay like i said it's a large chunk to go through. I'm going to do my best not to read it all. No promises. <laughs> Sometimes I do get carried away. Um, but I want to start off with 22 verse 16. So if you have your Bible or your app or whatever it is that you use, uh, please turn there with me. Um, chapter 22 and talk, and all the way through 23.9 talks about the social justices and I find it surprising I guess that by my counts and I'm sure I might have miscounted but I would say that in that short section 22 to 23 9 there are 18 laws I would say that is talked about so the first one in verse 16 if a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If the father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. You, whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. Whoever sacrifices to any god other than the Lord alone shall be devoted to destruction. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword. And your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. If you lend money to any of my people with, with who, you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him and you shall not exact interest from him. If you ever take your neighbor's cloak and pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body. And what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. You shall not revel God, nor curse the ruler of your people. You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest, and from the outflow of your, of your presses. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. You shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its mother, and on the eighth day you shall give it to me. You shall be consecrate, or consecrated to me. Therefore you shall not eat any flesh that is torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. You sh in 23, or chapter 23, you shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with the wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with many so as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. If you ever, 
If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. You shall not pervert the justice due to your poor in, the law, in his lawsuit. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and righteous. For I will not acquit the wicked. And you shall take no bride, for a bride blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. You shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. So, in that little section that I just read through real quick, I counted 18. Now that I'm reading it some, again, there might even be more than 18. But there is a lot of you shall, which God is saying that this is the way it's going to be. This is what I'm expecting of you. And when I look at some of these, that they're almost unheard of and hard to believe that we need to be told that we shouldn't do this. Um, first one that would come to mind would just be whoever lies with an animal should be put to death. I'm, I'm sorry. I, that's hard for me to fathom that that would even go that far that someone would think that way. Um, I do know that it happens in the world, different cultures, but where we're at in America, um, I would say that I would never ever look at it that way um so that kind of appalls me in, in, a, in a sense but then the whole um talking about your enemy's oxen if you see see him on a burden or you see the ox or donkey going astray that you're actually supposed to help them we could we could learn something from that even in today's world that even if it is our enemy or it's someone we don't like. We are to put our differences aside. And if they are in trouble, we are to help them. We're not supposed to abandon them. I think we'd learn something from that. So carrying on, we'll be in 2310. This is going to be talking about Sabbath and festivals. For six years, you shall sow your land and gather its yield. But the seventh year, you shall let it rest in my fallow, that the poor of your people may eat and eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. You shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may have rest, and the son of your servant woman and the alien may be refreshed. Pay attention to all that I have said to you, and make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let it be heard on your lips. So, once again, God is bringing in the idea of the Sabbath, which is rest. I know we typically say Sunday is the day of rest, and it's the seventh day of the week. Well, it's biblical. God wants us to rest. He doesn't want us to just get burnt out. I, for one, am the person that is go, 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 go. If I'm awake and if I've got the energy, I typically want to be doing something being active. If I get a moment of quiet time sitting on the couch, watching a movie, typically I can fall asleep in a matter of minutes. And that's partly because I'm so, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to use the word burnt out for myself because I don't feel I'm burnt out. But I know that I can push myself to the brink of exhaustion. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. We live in a very fast paced world where we feel the pressures from all around us that if we're not active and doing something that we are wasting time or that we are that we could be doing something more productive that's kind of how we have been uh, groomed to be is that if you're awake you need to be doing something you need to be doing something productive and helpful, whether it's for your personal gain or for um, the help of others, you need to be moving is what we're going to be. But reading passages like this, I, uh, I need to be constantly reminded that it is okay to say no to things, that I too need rest. I'm. We have a saying that goes around that you're no use 
to our, yeah, you're no use to us dead. Um, and it, that's kind of a harsh thing to say, but it's true that if you're so burnt out that you can't give it your all, or you're so burnt out to the point where you need to just stop everything, that's not good. So, so take that moment, take that rest, that rest day, whether it's a Sunday, whether you've got a swing shift and your rest day needs to be in the middle of the week. Take that moment, take that Sabbath and just rest and rest in him. When I say him, I mean in God. So when you're doing that rest, read your Bible, um, spend time in prayer. Just use that moment to be with God and be still. So that that's all I'll say on the Sabbath. I for one need to remember to take those breaks. Verse 14, three times in the year you shall keep a feast to me. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread as I command you. You shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the point of time in the month of Abib, or in it you come out of Egypt, then shall appear before me empty handed. You shall keep the feast of harvest, of the first fruits of your labor, and of what you sow in the field. You shall keep the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, when you gather in from the field the fruit of your labor. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the fat of my feast remain until the morning. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. So these feasts that God is asking us to do three times a year, from what I'm getting out of that and how I take it is, we need to have times of celebration with God. We need to be with uh, their believers, and we need to be focused on God. And God's asking for the first fruits, the first of your yield, the first of your flock. God doesn't want the leftovers. And that kind of goes back to that concept of the Sabbath. God doesn't want what's left. He wants what's first. So we may not use or call these festivals the same thing in today's world and today's culture. But I would say that we do have festivals in a sense. We've got our Christmas, we've got our Easter. Um, those are t those are religious holidays. But I don't think we need to always just rely on those particular days. Especially when it comes to getting with fellow believers and having a time of celebration to just worship and be in awe with God. I know in this world of COVID-19, coronavirus, that we are frowned upon and discouraged from getting together in big groups. And there's not much we can really do about that. And I'll say it sucks. But we still can't let that discourage us from being the hands and feet of Jesus, being with the church, which is the people. The church is not a building. The church is the people. We need to do what we can to still be with each other and encourage each other. Um, it's too easy in the current state of affairs that we're in for people to just shut in and forget about the uh, importance of communicating, um, the importance of being with fellow believers. It's so easy to just focus inward on what's going on and not necessarily think of others, I guess you can say is how I would word it. We need to still reach out to people, whether in this day and age, we use Zoom to do uh, meetings and calls or you FaceTime. Make sure we're not letting people fall to the wayside during this time. I know in the past, churches have had to shut down because of what's going on. And I pray that we don't get to that point again. But if we do get to the point where we have to go strictly online or and whatnot, I pray that everyone listening is still reaching out to the people that we don't see, the people that we would see on a Sunday morning. Don't let that community, don't let that family just start to fizzle out. And 
it's a time of celebration that we get to do this, that we are not persecuted or gathering, that we're not persecuted for worshiping our God. So I'll buy so box there. The last part of this is just the conquest that God has promised. And I want really what I want to take out of this conquest is that God promises that he's going to take care of their enemies, that he's promising them their land. But there's a verse in here where it says that he isn't going to do it in one year. And the reason is that if he really were to wipe out all of their enemies and give them the land in one year, the land would become desolate and not be usable because they don't have enough people to actually occupy the whole land and take care of it the way it should be. God has a plan. And he, he knows more than us, and we need to keep that in mind. So just real quick, verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, I will blot them out. You shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I, yeah, number your days. I will send my terror before you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn your backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites before you. I will not drive them out before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply among you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased and possessed the land. I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the, to the Euphrates, or I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell on your land, lest they make you sin against me, for if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. So like I said, God has a plan. He has expectations. He knows better than us. So when we get carried away and we feel that we need to steer the ship because we feel that we know what's best, take a step back in that moment and know that what God sees isn't just what we see with our blinders on. God sees the big picture. He sees the before, he sees the present, and he sees the end game. So even though we're in a crazy time right now, know that there's still hope. Know that God is steering the ship. And we need to be unified in knowing that fact. We need to come together as believers, as a family. And we need to be there and encourage each other. So I'm glad you tuned in today. I look forward to the next time I talk with you. If you have any questions or if you want to reach out to me, please feel free to. I would love to have some interaction with you. Well, until then, God bless.